five seed evidence of a divine being. Um, we call this the the two sons or the two heirs, and I, I'll explain what that that means in a second. But we basically know that you know, are you going to give your inheritance to your son? Is he the heir, or are you going to give it to the stranger down the street? And so, so when I say the two sons and then the two heirs, I'm repeating myself. I'm just showing you that that your God is not going to give God the Father is not going to give his inheritance right to someone who is not his son. And so, let's let's read the context. It says, "Now these are the generations of." The sons of Noah, and we know that Noah had three sons: Shem, Ham, and and Japheth. And, and we've talked about this. We we talked about rightly dividing seed, and and that when we talk about the word seed, that the seed is the 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 substance that is in the loins of a man, and. And, and that's one of the definitions. And the other definition is when that seed that's in the loins of the man receives, gets a body, uh, it becomes what we call a ancestor or a um, descendant. It's the, same, it's the same seed, except the seed when he's in the loins doesn't have a body. And then once it, once it enters into the egg of the woman and then it, it, the, the, the child is born, it's the same seed that was in that loins of that man, but now it has a body. And and we've we've also talked about the two seeds in the sense that um, there is a physical and and there is a spiritual seed. And we're gonna probably over the next two to three weeks, we're going to because the Old Testament is a shadow; it's a picture. You you see the same pictures. What God is showing you in the New Testament, He's going to go back in the Old Testament. He's going to give you pictures of this to show it to you, and and that's what we're going to do the next couple of weeks. Is we're going to give you pictures of what it means to be a physical seed and a spiritual seed. And the first example we're going to give here is going to be Abraham. He says, after these things, the word of the Lord came into Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abraham said, Lord God, what wilt thou give, him, give me, seeing I go childless? So, when he says childless, does that mean that Abraham did not have seed in his loins? No, it doesn't. Okay. It just means that he did not have a seed that had yet had a body yet, right? Because right. he's childless. And he goes on and says, And the steward of my house, which is a stranger, is not someone that came out of my loins, he's not my child. The steward uh, of my house, which is his name is Eleazar of Damascus, he's going to get my. You know, he's basically going to get be my heir. He's going to get everything I have because, guess what? I have no child. I'm childless. Right. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed. Did, now, when, when Abraham said this, he didn't mean that he didn't have that seed in his loins. He meant the seed that was in his loins had not been given a body. Therefore, no seed means childless. He's just, he's repeating himself. I have no seed. I am childless. Right. And, and lo, one born in my house, not from my loins, Eleazar, guess what? He is my heir. He's, when I die, if I have no seed, if I have no child, he is my heir. And just so you know, an heir is the man who succeeds or is to succeed another in the possession of lands, tenements, and hereditaments by descent. He's a descendant. Uh, the man or, on whom the law cast an estate of inheritance. He's the heir, right? Uh, he goes on and says, uh, one who is entitled to possess. 
uh, it is his right to possess the, inher the inheritance because of his descent. He is a descendant. And remember, that is the second definition. It is when the seed receives a body, he now becomes a descendant, or he becomes, guess what? Heir. Heir. All right, so does it, that, that's, that's easy enough for everybody to understand. Yes. So, so Abraham's saying, listen, I know I have a seed, I know I have seed in my loins, but I, you haven't, Lord, you haven't given me a child, and therefore you haven't given me an heir. Therefore, this stranger, he's going to get my inheritance. But I want you to see what the Lord says to him. He says, and behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, this stranger that did not come from your loins, this Eleazar, this shall not be what? Thine heir. Why? Well, but he that shall come forth out of what? That own vow. So, so the, the, the seed that is in your loins, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to, I'm going to give that seed a body. And then he's, guess what he do? He's going to come out. You're no longer going to be childless. You're going to have a son. He's going to be thy heir. And that's what he says. But he that shall, shall, shall come forth out of thine own bow shall be what? Thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. Right? Now look. He's saying, look at the stars. You can't number them. Your seed shall be just like those stars. You're not going to be able to number them. Now, what's he talking about? Is he talking about the seeds that's in his loins? Or is he talking about the seeds that are going to be given bodies? He's talking about the bodies, right? Is it going to come out of your loins? And, and so the, whatever this, this child is that I give you, from him, you're going to have so many descendants that just like the stars, you're not going to be able to number them. <clears throat> and why this, this is important is because this is not talking about, because what a lot of people, modern Christianity, want to do, they want to make all the scripture be about believing upon Jesus about having the baby, having the child, and, and, and that's not what he's talking about here. The entire context is being what? An heir. And look what he says. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of, the, out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to do what? Inherit, Inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I, shall I know that I shall inherit it? So this is about inheritance. This is about heir. This is about children. This has nothing to do. The picture has nothing to do about unbelievers. Because an unbeliever is not a son. And if you're not a son, you're not going to be the heir. And if you're not going to be the heir, you're not going to get the inheritance. So it's talking about not, not believing upon Jesus. The entire picture is telling us, son, this is how you get your inheritance. Now, look at an ancestor. An ancestor is one who descends, which means, guess what? By descent, he is a descendant. He is someone who came from the loins. We give the title, this title, ancestor, to a person who is to, guess what, inherit after the death of the ancestor. So Abraham has descendants. He's the ancestor of his children. And the descendants are the ones, or the children, or the heirs, are the ones who get to inherit. That's what it says. A man's children are his heirs. In most monarchies, the king's eldest son is heir to the throne. And a nobleman's eldest son is the heir. So if a man has three sons, 
which one would be the heir to the throne? If a king has three sons, it's going to be the oldest son, right? Yes. Now, 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 I'm going to. I want to show you this because God has this law in Deuteronomy, and this is the first law of who gets who gets the the inheritance. He says, if a man have two wives, one beloved and another hated. So we can, this is going to be a perfect example with Abraham because Abraham, he had Sarah and then Sarah gave him Hagar. Guess what? One is beloved, one's hated. And they have borne him children, both the beloved and the hated. If the firstborn son, right? be hers that it was hated then it shall be when he maketh his sons to inherit that which he hath that he may not make the son of the beloved what firstborn for the yeah. son of the hated so it doesn't matter what he likes you can go to, you we can use the example of the man we're probably going to talk about next week isaac had two sons esau and jacob who was the firstborn esau and just because if you hated Esau, did that mean that, or, or you hated his wife, because would it matter? No. It, it doesn't matter. God's law is the firstborn son is going to have a right to the inheritance. Now, look what he says. He says, and he may not make the son of the beloved firstborn before the son of the hated, which is indeed the firstborn. The firstborn is the firstborn, and you, God is saying you can't change it. But he shall acknowledge the son of the hated for the firstborn by giving him what? A double portion. A double portion. So most of the inheritance is going to go. So if this man has three sons or four sons or ten sons, let's say he has ten sons. The firstborn has a right to half of that. And then to take the other half and they'll divide it up between the other son. But the, the firstborn son, and just like in the in the in the in this with the king, the king has many sons. The firstborn son by right should be the one that is heir to the throne. Now he says. Uh, by giving him a double portion of all that he had, for he is the beginning of his strength. The right of the firstborn is his. Now, what does the right of the firstborn mean? That means by birth, it is his right. Therefore, the firstborn has the what? The birthright. Now, birthright is just those two words put together. Any right or privilege to which a person is entitled by what? By birth. Just... He didn't do nothing to deserve it. He's just the one that was born first and such as an estate descendable by law to an heir. So that's the first law. And that's the one that you go by. If, if, and there's going to be another, there's going to, there's going to be another law though. This is on, this process only happens based upon the obedience of the sons. And you're going to see that throughout the scripture. Was David the firstborn of Jesse? No. Oh. Was Solomon the firstborn of David? No. So it's it's not by right the firstborn should have been the king. Matter of fact, when you start looking at David's sons, the firstborn thought in, in his mind he should have been the he should have been the king, not Solomon, right? And so 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 this has, even though this law applies, if the firstborn son is not suitable or is disobedient or for some reason does not meet the standards, that he can lose his his birthright. He can he can lose the right to be the heir to the throne or to the inheritance. So we come along and it says, as for it is written that Abraham had what? Two sons. The one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. Now, 
which was the firstborn. The firstborn was Ishmael, right? Hagar, she was hated. And by this law here, by God's law, guess who should have got the double portion? Ishmael. But Ishmael should have got the, the firstborn. But we had to understand something that God had made a promise to Abraham. And God can't break his promise. And not only that, the Old Testament is going to be a picture. It's going to be a shadow of something in the New Testament that we've already learned. We, we learned in our past couple of Bible studies that there were Jews that believed upon Jesus that were actually sons, right? But guess what? They didn't continue in his word. They were trying to kill him. And therefore, even though they believed and even though they were a son, they were not Abraham's children. Right. In other words, there is a physical seed. There is a spiritual seed. And so in that picture that we learned in the New Testament, this is this or not a picture. This is the picture we're going to learn. We're going to see examples of God showing you that there are two types of sons. He says, and that's what he's going to say. Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bond woman was born after what it says, the flesh, and he of the free woman was by promise. So you're going to have one son. They're both. Are they both Abraham's sons? Yes. Yes. They're both heirs, right? But one is after the flesh. And guess what? This law right here will not apply if you live. God's trying to show you a picture here. If you are a believer that walks after, remember, born after the flesh, what does that mean? Well, we learn that being born again by the word of God, right? Being born by incorruptible seed means to be renewed, to be regenerated, right? <laughs> To, 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 to be renewed by knowledge, how often, day by day, that it is a process that God is trying to change you into a begotten son because Isaac here is going to be the only what? Begotten son. Ishmael is not a begotten son. Why is Ishmael not a begotten son? Because he's not born again by the word of God. He's born again by the what? By the flesh. And we know this is true because he tells us there are two types of believers. He says, nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having the seal. The Lord knoweth, what he says, them that are what? His. Do you think that Abraham knew that Ishmael and Isaac were his? Yes. Because when Sarah came to Abraham and said, you know what, we need to get rid of this boy, and we'll talk about it. I, I'll, I'll hold off. We'll get ready to talk about that. He said, the Lord knoweth them that are his. He knows all these children are his, right? All of them. And he says, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ, everyone that nameth the name of Christ, in other words, everyone that are his, right? They need to do something. They need to depart from iniquity, which implies that there are believers that are taking part in iniquity and they need to what? Depart from that and they belong to him. But he says in a great house, whose house? God's house. There are not only vessels of gold and silver, silver, silver but also of wood and earth. Some of these believers are to honor and some to what? Dishonor. Dishonor. Some are by promise and some are born after the flesh and some are born again, right? Not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed by the word of God. So you have two types of Christians. One, both of them believed upon Jesus. And the only ones that are going to be begotten are the ones who, day by day, right, they are renewed with knowledge. They are born again by the word of God, and they're being changed. And then you're going to have the ones who are born after the flesh. They live in the world. 
They, they care about the things of the world. That's the most important thing to them. And they never, ever grow. He says, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow, right? So we have two types of believers here. We have some believers who are honorable and some that are dishonorable, right? Some that are born after the flesh and some that are born again by the word of God. Now, he's going to say something here. If a man, right, a Christian, purge himself from these. So, what does he mean? Well, there's only two types of people here. There are honorable honorable believers, and there are dishonorable believers. And he'll tell these believers that are honorable, if they will purge yourself from the dishonorable believers, that you shall be a vessel unto honor, you'll be sanctified, you'll be holy, and you will be meat for the master's use. You'll be ready to work for your father, your master, and prepared unto every good work. But then he goes on. He says, flee also. Well, what does, when he, he gives you all these things, this youthful lust, flee also youthful lust, what does that word also? It means I want you to flee this here, but I also want you to flee this. So he tells them to flee you for us also. What else are they fleeing? Well, if you're a vessel of honor, guess what you should be fleeing from? You should be fleeing, yeah, the, the believers that are living in dishonor, the, flee, the, the, the believers that are living after the flesh. You should... You should separate from these. You should purge yourself from these. You should flee them. You should stay away from them and follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, right? So, so that's the thing that you're going to see here in the example, right? You're going to see, you're going to see that Abraham had two sons. This is a picture of two believers. One is born after the flesh. One is he's dishonorable right and then you're going to see the one that is 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 by promise you're going to see the one that is honorable you're going to see the one that is being born again uh, by incorruptible seed after the word of god so you're going to see two types of believers here and what did he just tell what did timothy just tell the believer who wants to be an honorable believer to do Purge yourself or flee from the what? The dishonorable believer. And Abram called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him, Isaac. Now, Isaac, now remember, Isaac is the second born son, but he's the son of promise. He's the only begotten son. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac, being eight days old, as God had commanded him. And Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. And Sarah said, God hath made me to laugh so that all that hear will laugh with me. And she said, who would have said unto Abraham that Sarah should have given, chil given children suck? For I have borne him a son in his old age. And the child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. And look what Sarah's going to do. She's going to see the son of Hagar, Ishmael, the Egyptian, which she had born unto Abraham, right? The, his, his firstborn. And guess what he was doing? Mocking. He was mocking. He was, does that sound like something that a obedient child does? Does that sound like something somebody, that sounds more like a dishonorable, that, that sounds like some, uh, a child of a child of God that's walking after the flesh right and so she sees him and he's mocking her son wherefore since she saw this she said to Abraham cast out this bondwoman and what her son now people say oh that's so evil that's so mean she's the one that did it this is a picture, okay? This is a picture. 
And he, she said, for, look what she says, for the son, which means she's acknowledging that, guess what? Ishmael is the son, he is a descendant, he is an heir to Abraham. Right. The son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son. So this has got nothing to do with whether they're a son or not a son. This has to do with inheritance. And the thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of what? His son. He never, Abraham never says, this is not my son. Sarah never says, this is not his son. Sarah is saying that this has everything to do with the inheritance. And God said unto Abraham, let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bondwoman. And all that Sarah has said unto thee, hearken unto her voice. Why? For in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Not, with, this is a picture of the spiritual seed. Remember, both of these men are a picture of physical seed, but as it applies to spiritual seed. Remember what he told those Jews? He says, yes, you're, you're the seed of Abraham. I acknowledge it. But guess what you are not? You're not Abraham's children he's talking about a spiritual seed here and so guess who is the spiritual seed here it is isaac he's the only begotten he says and isaac shall thy seed be called now look now now listen a abraham acknowledged that ishmael was his son even sarah acknowledged guess what that a that that ishmael was abraham's son now look what God's going to do. And also of the son of the bondwoman will I make a nation. Look what it says. Because he is what? A seed. A seed. They're both the seed, the physical seed of Abraham. Right. But only in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Only Isaac is the only what? Begotten, begotten son. Because, guess what? In a great house, there are vessels of honor. There's vessels of dishonor, right? There's ones that are born after the flesh. There's the ones that are born after the flesh. And there's ones that are born again after incorruptible seed, after the word of God. There's one by promise. And so, what did he tell? What did, what did no, this is important because this is like Timothy's last, I mean, Paul's last letter to Timothy. He's telling something here. Him. He's saying, if you want to be a vessel of honor, if you want to be one of these believers that are called and chosen and going to get the promise and going to get the inheritance, you need to purge yourself and flee from these dishonorable vessels, even though they're still in the same what? They're still in the same house, aren't they? Yes, yes. In the great house, right? They're all in the same house, but 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 there's a point. They're all in the great house that you need to get away from them. Yes. And and guess what? Is it that what he's doing here? Yes. And he says, guess what? I, I will guess what God's going to tell him to do. Hearken to the voice, right? Cast her out. So I don't want Isaac to be growing up with who? With Ishmael. I want them separated because guess what? Ishmael will affect, he will continue to mock, he'll continue uh, because he's, not, he's born after the flesh, he cares about the things in the flesh, he's going to affect this. So there needs to be a separation between God's children. The ones, the ones that want to walk after the spirit, they need to go over here and get away from the ones that are walking after the flesh. Right. He says, now we, brethren, right, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. So he's talking to believers that are trying to walk after the spirit. 
believers that are being renewed and born again day by day. They're being changed, right? That's what Paul's talking. He's writing to these believers in Galatians say, we're, we're like Isaac. We're the children promised. But as then he that was what? Born after the flesh, talking about Ishmael, persecuted him that was what? Born after the spirit. Right. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed. You know what he says? Just like it was then, even so it is what? Now. And that's what I'm telling y'all. <laughs> that's the world we're living in. When you, when you are trying to walk after the Spirit, when you read the Word every day, when you are being born again and God is changing you, and you're trying to tell those vessels of dishonor, the ones that don't want to repent, the ones that want to live after worldly things, when you tell them that they, they, they should turn from worldly things, they should read the Word every day, that just going to the church on Sundays and Wednesdays is not enough, Right? You know what they do? They do exactly what Ishmael did to Isaac. And, and what was, they mock him. And he says, Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. Now, right. I'm telling you that this is a picture of you separating from disobedient believers. But I'm also going to tell you, this is a picture of the judgment seat of Christ. That when every believer stands before the Lord, guess what? There's going to be two types of believers there. Right. And if you have been a believer who is not a promise, but guess what? You were living dishonorably. You were being born after the flesh. You cared about the things of the world, right? Right. Guess what? Even though you might have been the firstborn, right, and you're a son, does that mean you're going to get the inheritance? No, Abs no. Absolutely not. And that's what he says. He says, cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not, look at the word, shall not be what? Heir. Heir. It has nothing to do with being born again, being believing upon Jesus. It has nothing to do with it. You cannot be a son until you believe and accept Christ as your Savior. Once you do that, you have a right to the inheritance. You have a right to be, you're an heir. You can get the inheritance now because you're a son. Remember, remember the story of Abraham and Eleazar. He says, no, 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 no. You, God says, you don't have to worry about this stranger that didn't come out of your loins being your inheritance. Because you're going to have seed. You're going to have a child. You're not going to go childless. You're going to have a child. The problem was that Abraham and Sarah didn't want to wait. So they had a, they had a child that was born after the flesh. But he wasn't the child of promise, was he? He's giving you a picture. He's telling you, Ishmael is still a son. God acknowledged he was still a son. And also of the son of the bondwoman will I make a nation because he is thy seed. Ishmael is a child. But Ishmael is not going to get me the child of promise. He's not going to get the inheritance. Isaac is. And so God has given you this picture in the Old Testament to show you there are two types of believers that are going to stand before him and one will get to inherit and one will be what? Cast out. So we have two types of son. We have a begotten son, which is the son of promise. And he's the son of promise because he's born after the spirit. And then we have another son, which is Ishmael, which is Esau, which is up here in Timothy. It's the what? The dishonorable believer, right? That son is not of promise. He's, you know why? Because he's born after the flesh. He can, you know that if you're a son and you're walking after the flesh, you can be this son right here. Right here. Because you are begat through the word of truth. You can be born again by the word of God. You can be renewed if you will eat of the word 
and drink, you know, what's he say? Unless a man eat of my flesh and drink, he have no life. But if you will daily eat the word and you will be renewed in knowledge day by day, God is changing you. Or you can live after the flesh. You can go after the things of this world. You can worry about being rich. You can worry about having a mansion and cars and money and 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 giving your flesh every pleasure in this world. You have a right as a son to choose that. And that's what he's trying to tell you here. This has nothing to do with unbelievers. All the people that were to giving you examples are still sons. Abraham Sarah and God acknowledged that Ishmael was the seed of Abraham. Just like Jesus acknowledged what? That the Jews that believed on him were the seed of Abraham. But you're not sons. What did he mean by that? You're not a begotten son. You're not a spiritual son. You're a fleshly son. He says, by faith, Abraham... When he was called to go into a place which he should, what it says, receive that foreign inheritance or after receive foreign inheritance. So he would, because God called Abraham to go to a place that after he should receive foreign inheritance. He wasn't going there. He wasn't giving it to him right then and there, was he? No. This was going to be an inheritance that he was received later. So he obeyed and he went out, not knowing whither he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of what? Promise. Now, remember, the begotten sons are the sons of promise. And the sons of promise are the ones that are born after the word, after the spirit, right? Right. And, and he's saying that Abraham was one of those, and Isaac was one of those, and Jacob was one of those, and you can be one of those, right? But guess what? It's after that you get the inheritance. Because he went to this land to promise which he was going to inherit, right? And he dwelled there as in a strange country. Dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob. Look what he says, the heirs with him. So Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were heirs. Or I'm, I'm sorry, Isaac and Jacob were heirs with Abraham of the same promise. Why? Because they were begotten. They were born after the what? The spirit. They were vessels of honor, not of dishonor. See, that's what he said. Abraham had two sons. One born after the flesh and one was by promise. So for you, I want you to look what that word promise means. Okay. He says, in a, a promise in a general sense is a declaration written or verbal made by one person to another, which binds the person who makes it either in honor, conscience, or law to do or forbear a certain act specified. So God made a promise to Abraham, right? It is a declaration which gives to the person to whom it is made, Abraham, a right to what? Expect. Expect. Does it mean right then and there? No, afterwards, he'll get the inheritance, right? You have a right, because when God makes a promise, can God lie? No. No. If, if, I, if, I, have two if I have a child here, or let's say the parents, they have this, this husband, this wife, they have, he's got a young son there, and him and his wife need to have a conversation, and he tells the young boy, he says, listen, son, I promise you, you see this dollar bill here? I want you to sit over there and when me, don't don't interrupt, me and your mom's got to have a conversation. I promise to give you the dollar when me and your mom are done, right? right. And so, so the son goes to sit down and the, the husband and wife are talking. The husband and the wife are talking. Does the son have the dollar? No. No. What does he have? He has the promise. And he knows his father is going to give him what he promises. Right. So he doesn't actually have, have the dollar bill. He's got the promise. And, he's, and guess what? He has, because of the promise, he has a right to what? 
expect, okay. right? And when does he have a right? When does he have a right to expect it? After he shall receive it. When the conversation's over. Right. That's what a promise is. A promise is not you getting that that gift then. It is it is it is the words of the person who promised it, and you have an expectation in the future to get it. A promise can be absolute or guess what? Conditional. The obligation to fulfill a conditional promise. Uh oh, look what it says. A conditional promise depends on the performance of the condition. So if you do what you're supposed to do, what if the, the boy keeps coming over and inter interrupts his father and his mother? Should he expect to get it? No. No. It depends on the performance of the condition. Your condition is sit over here, be quiet to me and your mom's done, and I'll, the promise is you'll get it. But it's based upon a conditional promise. You have hope of it if you do what you're supposed to do. Obedient. Be obedient, expectation, or that which affords, now what it says, that which affords expectation of what kind of distinction? Future. Future. You're Abraham, one day, this land, you're going to get it as an inheritance. But right now, guess what he was doing? He was dwelling in the land of promise as in a what? A strange, it wasn't his. It was promised to him. He has a right to expect it, but it's not his right now. So, that's important. Right. Because, remember, the inheritance, the inheritance is for children. There's two types of children. The firstborn has a right to that if they're obedient, but if they, if they, if they don't care about their inheritance, if they're disobedient, it can be passed down to the next child. Right. Now, look what he says here. And he said, men, brethren, and fathers, hearken. Um, and this is Stephen, right? He says, the God of glory appeared unto, the fa unto our father Abraham. He's talking to the seed of Abraham. Right. When he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Quran, and said unto him, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and come into the land which I will show thee. Then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans, and dwelt in Quran, and from thence, <coughs> when his father was dead, he removed him into, the, into this land, wherein you now dwell. And he gave him, guess what? None inheritance in it. No, not so much as to set his foot on, yet he what? Promised that he would give it to him, but yet he didn't what? So he didn't actually have the very thing that God had promised him yet because it wasn't time. But guess what he had? He had a future expectation on it based upon the what? hope and the performance he had a right to expect it even though he was dwelling in that land right as in a what do you know that you are promised that you can reign as kings and priests on earth but your own earth you know what you're doing you're dwelling in the land of promise right now patricia carlos this earth is the land of promise for me and you. He says, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thou will be done where? On earth. This earth, one day Jesus Christ will come back. He will be the king of this earth. And if we do what we're supposed to, we get, we're get we co-heirs with him. We get to inherit with him, right? It, we're living in the land of promise, but we're, we're living in this earth as in a strange country. We have a hope and expectation that one day we're going to get this earth as an inheritance yes. he says and he gave him none inheritance in it no not so much as to set his foot on yet he promised that he would give it to him for possession but not just to him to his seed and he even promised it to him when as yet he had what a child remember he was childless he thought that this Eleazar, and he says, no, 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 no. 
I'm going to give it to you and your children. But guess what? There's two types of children. Remember the Jews. What did, he, what did he say to the ones that believed on him? If you'll continue in my word. But they didn't. He says, you are the physical seed of Abraham. But guess what? Guess what the problem is? You don't continue in my word. You're trying to kill me. And even though you're the physical seed, you're not Abraham's children. You want to be Abraham's children? Guess what you need to do? You need to do right this right here. You need to purge yourself from these. You need to flee these. Who are these? These are the sons that are, these are still children of God that are born after the flesh. That, don't, that are not begotten, that, that think the world's the most important thing. They don't care about their inheritance. They think, oh, everybody gets a reward. Everybody gets the kingdom. Everybody gets the inheritance. Listen, that is a lie. I don't care how much the, the, they want to persecute me and mock me and laugh at me. That's, they're doing exactly what God said they would do. Exactly. Right? And that is exactly what he said. Just... It, it, um, where's it at? If I can find the verse here, um, he says, cast out the bondwoman, right? Uh, and her son, the son of the bondwoman should not be heir. He says, it's, that's the way it is even today. Exactly. That those believers who don't believe that they can miss the kingdom, who don't believe they're giving up their inheritance for worldly goods, who don't believe what we're saying, they mock us. They laugh at us. They, they think that it's a joke. Right. It's not going to change. Matter of fact, it's going to get worse. Because let me let me ask you this. What did those what did those Jews who believed on him do to him? They crucified him. They, they crucified him. They hated him. And if they hated him, guess what they're going to do to you? They're going to hate you. They're going to kill you. Ask Stephen. The very man, the very man that we're we're reading about right now, right? Mm -hmm. He says right here. He says, uh, "Oops, oh, I, I lost my spot." Okay, so he says right here. He says, "Yet he promised that he would give it to him for possession and to his seed when he was yet without a child." Now we brethren, as Isaac was. Because there's two types of son. Right. When he's right to these Galatians, he's talking to believers that are being born again, that are being begotten, that are going to be begotten children. They're children of promise, right? He says that we as, uh, now we brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. Not, not, because we're not walking after the flesh. But as in, he that was born after the flesh Persecuted him that was what? And, and that's what it says. Even so it is now. That's that's the way it's always been. And it's the way it's always going to be. So you make your choice. God's going to give you a choice. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? When you stand at the judgment seat, guess what? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. If you're walking after the flesh, if you believe upon Jesus, but you're not continuing in his word, you're not being born again, right? When you stand at the judgment seat, you're going to be cast out. Out of the kingdom. Because the millennial kingdom and eternal, eternal life is the eternal life. When you believe upon Jesus, you have the promise of the gift of eternal life. And then nobody can take that from you. Nobody. You can live like the devil. You can walk after the flesh. You can do whatever you want to do. No one can take that from you. But the inheritance, the kingdom, guess what? You're going to give up your inheritance. He says, the son of the bondwoman, in other words, the disobedient, the dishonorable believer, shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. That's the picture. There, God is not going. God is not going to give a person who gave up their entire life to serve Him, 
to to do what he said, to try to be obedient to all the things he says. He's not, he's not going to take the believer over here that all he did was live after his flesh, commit sin, never read the word. You're not going you're not going to be heir with the son of the free woman. It, I mean, it doesn't mean you're not a son. Look at what he says. The son of the bondwoman, the son of the, they're both sons. Isn't that what he said? Abraham, Sarah, and God both acknowledge that Ishmael was Abraham's seed. Jesus acknowledged those Jews that believed on him that they were the seed of Abraham. But you're not Abraham's spiritual son. Isaac is. Jacob is. You can be too. And that's what he says. We labor. Talking to the Corinthian church. We labor. Why? Why? Why are you laboring? Are you laboring because you're laboring because you want to be a child of God, right? No. If you're laboring to be a child of God, you'll never be a child of God because becoming a child of God is by faith alone, apart from works. Just believe that you're a sinner and he's your savior. If, if he's telling somebody to labor here, he must be talking to the church at Corinth. He's talking to believers and believers. Guess what we're supposed to do? We labor. Why? Why do we labor? That whether present or at, uh, or absent, we may be what? Because if you don't labor, you're not going to be accepted of Him. If you walk after the flesh, you're not going to be accepted of Him, right? You must labor because you're going to have to do something. You're going to have to appear believer. At the judgment seat of Christ. Why? That everyone, every believer, honorable, dishonorable, may receive the things that he did while he was in his body on this earth. According, you're going to receive, though, according to what you did in that body, what you've done. Whether it be good or whether it be what? Bad. So, that, what is he saying? He's saying, believer, you have to labor to be accepted of him. You have to do good to be accepted of him because you have to appear before him. And if you do bad, Paul is going to tell these believers something. I know the terror of the Lord. Therefore, guess what? I'm, going to, I, I'm doing the same thing right now that Paul was trying to do to these believers at Corinth. I'm saying you are a child of God. Are you a child of promise or are you a child walking after the flesh? Are you a vessel of honor or a vessel of dishonor? Are you a believer who continues in the word or a believer who has his word has no place in you? Are you a believer who is being born after the flesh or are you a believer who is being born again by the word of God? Are you being changed? Are you not being changed? Because there has to be a change. Yes. You can't stay a child. He says, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow. You have, uh, but when you're born again, that's the beginning of the race. That's not the end of the race. That's not the end all. Now you have the power to become a begotten son of God. Yes. But you got to read the word. You got you to gotta be renewed in knowledge day by day, right? Yes. He says, why does thou, believer, judge thy brother? Why does thou, believer, set it not thy brother? For we, all believers, shall all, all believers, whether you've done good or bad, all believers have to stand before the what? The judgment seat. There, you cannot change that. And when you stand before the judgment seat, there's something going to happen. He's going to say, cast out who? The bondwoman and her son. Who's the bondwoman? The bondwoman is the one that, the, bond, the, the bondwoman's son is the one who walks after the flesh. 
Right. He's a dishonorable believer. He's the one that doesn't continue in the word. He's the one that is not being begotten again. He says the time is come that judgment the judgment begins with the unbeliever. Is that what it says? No. It begins at the judgment seat and it begins with who? The house of God. And if it, the judgment, first begin or must begin at us, where does judgment begin? At the judgment seat. And you're going to be based upon what? Well, right here, according to that he had done. Everyone will receive what you did in your body. So if you're a believer out there, you're getting mad at me right now. saying, oh, no, all believers get it. You should question yourself because it says right here, these are not my words. It says, whatever you're doing right now in your body, if you're sinning, but that, oh, no, the, 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 the Jesus sacrifice paid for all my sins, past, present, and future. That's a lie. Uh -huh. If you sin willfully after you come, there's no more sacrifice. Ah, no, all my sins. Listen, so you, when he, when the Bible says charity shall cover a multitude of sins, he's talking to the unbeliever? No. An unbeliever can't be saved by charity. He's talking to a believer that charity is going to cover some of your sins. You're sitting there trying to tell me all of your sins that you're committing right now are automatically covered. Then what, why even put that verse in there? Why does he say, if you confess? If you don't need to confess, why, why, why does he say, if you confess, I'll forgive? If, why does he tell a believer that? Because if you sin after you believe upon Jesus, you're accountable for those sins. Confess them. Show some charity. Mer the merciful shall obtain mercy, right? Yes. If you believe this lie that all of your sins are automatically forgiven after you believe upon Jesus, you're, you're going to be one of these believers that are going to be cast out. It begins with God's house. He says, we know him that said vengeance. God's going to pour out some vengeance on some people here. He says, I will pay back. I will recompense. God's going to show vengeance. He's going to pay back, said the Lord. And again, who's he talking to? The Lord shall judge who? His people. And just like Paul said up here, guess what? Knowing therefore the what? The Lord. Look what he says here. It is a what? Fearful thing. To fall into the hands of the living God. Yes. Christ is coming back, and we all have to appear at the judgment seat. And when he does come back, he's going to have something with him. Let's, let's, let's look at this. Some of Paul's last words to Timothy, to all of us, really, because this was Paul's last epistle, right, before he died. This, so this is important. He says, I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall what? Judge. Where does judgment begin? And guess what? It's a fearful thing, right? Because we must all appear and we're going to we're going to receive everything done in our body, whether it's good or bad, knowing the terror of the Lord. And here comes the Lord and he's judging. He's going to judge his people. When is he going to judge his people? So when he appears, there's going to be a judgment seat. And guess what he's got with him? He's got a kingdom that's going to last for a thousand years. And since he's going to appear, he's going to tell you something. Preach the word. Be in, that's what we're doing here, right? You might not like what I'm saying, but I'm commanded to tell you. You might hate me. You might want to kill me. Maybe you will. I, that's your choice. But guess what? My command is to preach the word, to be in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering doctrine. You know why? Because a time is going to come in this world where they're not going to endure or put up with sound doctrine. But after their own lust, believers, he's talking to believers, after their own lust, they're going to heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. 
You know what these believers are going to do in the last days? They're going to walk after the flesh. They're going to be vessels of dishonor. They're going to turn away their ears from what? So when I'm sitting here preaching the word, because the word is truth, that's the same thing right there. The word, thy word is truth. They're going to turn away. That very word that I'm preaching to them, that very truth I'm preaching to them, they're going to turn away from it. And they're going to be turned into fables and to lies. But he tells Timothy, watch thou in all things, endure inflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. For look what Paul says, I am now ready to be offered. Well, I mean, when you saw the Lord, the Lord on the road to Damascus, that that's all that was required. Why didn't you, you weren't you ready to be offered then? No, that was the beginning of Paul's race, not the end. He says, I, why is it the end now? Well, he's going to tell you, I'm ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. He says, I have fought a good fight. I have what? This, this is the end here, not the beginning. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, since I've kept the faith, there is laid up for me a crown. You know what comes? You know what comes with a kingdom? A crown. Mm -hmm. Because he finished his course, because he kept the faith, right? And guess what he says? I have kept the faith. There's a laid up a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. He's going to give me a crown on that day. Because I finished my course. Well, why is it going to be on that day? Because when he appears, guess what he's going to have with him? A kingdom. Therefore, he's going to receive a crown because he finished his course. He's a vessel of honor. He didn't care what these believers who are walking around saying, oh, all the Christians get the inheritance. All the Christians get the kingdom. All the Christians get a crown. <laughs> all the Christians are honorable, right? No, they're not. No. If you are not a begotten son, if you are not renewed in knowledge day by day, you will not finish your course. You will not be a, get a crown, and you will be cast out. When? At his appearing in his kingdom, because yeah, because think about it. Because guess where judgment begins, right here, the judgment seat of Christ. And when you receive the things done in the body, whether good or bad, and knowing the terror of the Lord, I'm persuading you, believer, to reevaluate what you've been taught. Listen to me. You've been lied to, and the truth is in the Word. Read it. Pick it up for yourselves, open the book up, and read it, and you will find out that what I'm telling you is true. Not because I say it, not because anybody says it, but because it is impossible for God to lie. His word is true. Right. Amen. Paul says, dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before what? The unjust. Yeah. And not before the saints. So we have two types of people here. The just and the, the unjust and the saints. And he's writing to the church at Corinth. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by who? You, the saints. Are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know you not that we, the saints, shall judge angels? How much more the things that pertain to this life? If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. He's writing to the church at Corinth, to believers, to the saints. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you saints, among the church? No, not one that shall be able to judge between who? His brethren, this is not talking to unbeliever, but brother, go up to law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. So you got brothers, and you got the unbelievers. You got the unjust, you got the saints. 
He's talking to believers. He says, there now therefore there is utterly a fault among you, brothers, because you go to law brother with brother, right? One with another. Why, believers, think about this, talking to Christians, why, Christians, do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourself to be defrauded? You believers do wrong, and you defraud, and that you're what? Brethren, the entire context is believers doing wrong to other believers, taking their matters before the unjust, right? And the unbelievers. And then look what he says to these believers. Know you not that the unrighteous, this has got to do not with believing upon Jesus. This has to do with your inheritance. Not the gift. The gift is the promise of eternal life. That's the gift. The inheritance Look what it says right here. Whatsoever you do, believers at Colossians, do it heartily as to the Lord, not to men, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive, look what he calls the inheritance, the reward of what? That's not, that's not the gift. He tells you right here, don't you know, believers, that the unrighteous shall not inherit the reward of the inheritance, you will not inherit. And here it is what the reward of the inheritance is. The kingdom. And when is this kingdom going to come? Right? At his appearing. And that's when he's going to judge at the judgment seat. And if you are found to be a child of the flesh, a believer who has done bad and not good, guess what? you will not inherit the kingdom of God. <coughs> and then look what he says to the believers. The believers are going to like, oh, I don't believe that. I don't believe. He, he, Paul stops and says, listen, believer, be not deceived. If, if you believer are right now that are listening to me and you're a fornicator or an idolater and we all know and if you're going to sit here, I'm not even going to reason with you. If you tell me that believers can't do these things, just leave me alone. Because you know that they can. Because you've done them. If you're a fornicator believer or an idolater or an adulterer or you're effeminate, you're a man that acts like a woman, or you're an abuser of self with mankind, or you're a thief, or you're covetous, or you're a drunker, or you're a violent, or you're an extortioner, you're not going to inherit you shall not inherit the kingdom. Don't deceive yourself. Don't let that man in that pulpit deceive you. Pick up your book, pick up the Bible, and read it for yourself. The entire context is inheritance. God does not give. the Anyone that is not his child will not get the inheritance. You are not heir if you're not a child. Unless you believe upon Jesus as your Savior, you will never have a right to the inheritance. But once you accept Christ, you're now heir. But guess what? Being heir depends on how you live. And if you do these things right here, you will not inherit the kingdom. And that's what he says. It's a reward. Why? What? How, how do you get it? Well, whatsoever you do, right? When you serve the Lord, that's how you get it. But guess what, believers at Colossians? He that doeth wrong shall receive for what? The wrong. And when it comes to God, there is what? It doesn't matter whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. It does not matter whether you're a man or a woman. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. It, only one thing matters. Are you a vessel of honor? Or are you a vessel of dishonor? Have you taken that Bible? Have you read it every day? Have you let it? Have you continued in His Word? Have you let it change you? Are you serving Christ? And if you do all these things, when you stand before the Lord, 
you know what? If you seek after truth, that 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 seed's going to be in you, and he's going to look at you, and he's going to say, "Well done, thou good and faithful servant." But guess what? If you are a vessel of dishonor, if you have lived after the flesh, if you don't care about your inheritance, if you don't care about, we'll talk about Esau next week. He didn't care about his birthright. He didn't care about his inheritance. And if you don't care, when you stand before him, there's going to be gnashing of teeth. Amen. Because he's going to, yeah, exactly, he's going to say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. You're a vessel of dishonor. I never knew you. You walked after the flesh your whole life as a believer. You just didn't care. You couldn't pick up the Bible just to see whether it was true or not true. Anyway. Um, that's all that I have for this week.